Hi guys, uh, Alban, co-founder and CEO of Sketchfab, very happy to be here tonight. Uh, who has heard about Sketchfab before? Okay, a few people. <laughs> um, so yeah, first time I presented at Hardwired, it was like three years ago, so I'm very happy to, to be back here. Uh, so tonight, um, I want to talk about trends in the 3D, VR, and AR world. Um, starting with 3D is eating the world. Uh, seems like an obvious uh, thing to say, but we live in a 3D world, and we're literally surrounded by 3D files. Everything in this room has been designed in 3D before getting manufactured, and like everything we use every day, our cars, our phones, are designed in 3D before getting into production. This building has been designed in 3D, our games, our movies, our ads, it's all made in computer graphics and, and 3D files. But until now, this file format has stayed pretty much under the radar and really used only in like B2B use cases, B2B applications, private usage, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them being that it's, um, yeah, there are a lot of proprietary formats and requires complex software to, to handle and so on and so on. And this is undergoing a major change in both like creation of 3D content and consumption of 3D content, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. So in terms of creation, uh, there are two major trends disrupting um, 3D creation. First one is easier creation tools. Here I'm going to talk about just two tools illustrating this trend pretty, pretty well. The first one is Minecraft. Uh, so here on the left you see some sort of Egyptian pyramid. It was designed by Matthias, eight years old, uh, just using little blocks and building a 3D world based out of that. And kids are using Minecraft every day to build 3D things. And then on the right, uh, Tilbrush, so I don't know if you're familiar with Tilbrush, it's a, a VR painting tool that lets you design uh, and create things in VR. Uh, and so this drawing was done by a, a girl under 10 years old in just a few seconds, like it's, it's a VR doodle. And when you think about it, it's even more natural to design something in, in like a 3D environment than in, on a 2D sheet of paper, which is, kind of a, an approximation of, of what the real world is, which is 3D. And so like the, those two tools means that, yeah, today kids make 3D files on a daily basis. The other major trend uh, on the creation side is 3D capture. I guess you've all heard about like the new iPhone 7 and, and it's dual camera, and now it lets you make a depth map, on, uh, a depth, uh, map uh, which is uh, shown on the right. So a phone with, with two cameras means that you're able to, to capture 3D. Um, and this is pretty fascinating. Every phone maker is working on this, so Apple is, is the most well-known, but like Google is working on it with Project Tango. Intel wor is working on it with RealSense. Uh, Sony is working on it. UA just shipped the P9 with a double camera. HTC did that in the past. And like in 2017, we'll have phones that are able to capture the world in 3D. And when you think about it, and if you look at the evolution of capture, so we started with painting in caves, and then we got photography, and then we got video, and we just kept getting closer and closer uh, to what the world actually looks like. But the world's in 3D, and the day we get 3D capture, uh, we're gonna use it, and it's, it's gonna be the next big wave of, of uh, content, basically. And on, so here's a, a quick illustration uh, of a 3D capture. So this is my son, William. Uh, so you can't really see that it's a 3D capture because it's on a 2D screen. Uh, but I make a 3D portrait of him every month. And this was j j done just with my phone. Um, and yeah, we expect this to become something uh, common in, in the future, like just take 3 portraits of people. On the other end of the spectrum, 3D consumption is like undergoing kind of the, the same uh, shift, uh, and we're now able to consume 3D content uh, in a 3D environment, which is like either VR and AR, or AR. Uh, every major tech brand, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Intel, is working on, on a headset of some sort, either VR or AR. They are investing billions of dollars into this. Uh, Zuckerberg said that VR and AR content is gonna be the most uh, shared content on the internet in the next five years, um, and yeah, it means that Everybody is now able to make 3D content very easily, and now everybody is also gonna be able to consume and experience free content uh, in a great way. And so that's why we created Sketchfab to be kind of in between um, those two trends. Let creators uh, publish their 3D creations, either captures or creations, 
and then let people uh, consume this content either in 3D on, on the web or on a mobile or in a VR set. So Sketchfab is a, an embeddable 3D player uh, that displays 3D content that you can um, explore in VR with any headset. So it, it combines kind of the two aspects that defines YouTube, which is one being a, yeah, the best player for its format and the other one is being the largest library and community for this type of content. And if you look at any file format, they all gave birth to a, a ma major platform to host and share and display and embed those. So Flickr for pictures, SoundCloud for sound, YouTube for videos, and that's really what we want to do with Sketchfab and the, and the 3D format. Just a, a quick figures on, on Sketchfab. So we're actually reaching 1 million 3D files this week. I believe it should be uh, tomorrow or Friday. Um, we just passed half a million creators. And this makes us yeah, the largest library of, of volumetric content on the internet. Um, and the great thing is that it's not just static content in a, in, a, in, a, in a repository, it's content that has an audience, and we have five million unique visitors in that content that is consuming that content every day. We raised 10 million with great guys like First Mark, and we're a team of 25 people uh, between New York and Paris. And so now I just wanted to go through uh, First, a few lessons I learned on how we, how we got there, and then just a few use cases uh, in terms of content that we see on Sketchfab. I think the, the first lesson uh, that got where we are today is really like our tech stack and how we build Sketchfab. So we've, we've bet on WebGL very early on. So WebGL is the first um, web standard to display 3D graphics uh, in a browser without a plugin. It was initiated by Mozilla in 2011. And we started Sketchfab in 2012. We were pretty much the first company betting on WebGL at scale. Um, and if 3D never took off before, it's because it was so fragmented. And each like 3D software was building a, a 3D player that needed uh, a plugin to run. And just like before YouTube, you could watch a video on a, on a web page, but you, need, you needed to install like the Windows Media Player or something like that. And, and it, did, it didn't scale. And then YouTube uh, came up with a web-based uh, video player. And, and that scale. Um, and so, yeah, WebGL means we can embed our player anywhere on the web and distribute our content very easily. And WebVR is kind of the VR brother of WebGL, and it's a VR implementation uh, in the browser, which means we can distribute our content for VR anywhere on the web for any headset. So again, it's a solution that scales. Uh, and even if it's very early, it means that publishing something on Sketchfab is going to be able to run on any headset, like still the hardware agnostic which is just the best way for us to distribute our content. So our key lesson and kind of our key strategy uh, to get there has been our, our um, integration strategy and our ecosystem of partners. Very early on, we've made sure that we would be integrated with all creation tools. Uh, so just like on iMovie, you can publish a video to YouTube in one click without leaving I iMovie. And we've done that with all creation tools. So we started with uh, 3D software like Blender, 3ds Max, and so on. Uh, we're native in Photoshop, for example, so anyone who has Photoshop can send a 3D file from Photoshop to Sketchfab in one click. And then we started doing that with game engines and games, so you can publish a 3D file from Minecraft to Sketchfab. Um, and now we're doing that with more and more 3D capture software, so like you make a, a capture with your phone and you can share it to Sketchfab in one click. And this was the surest way to make us the default way to, to share 3D on the internet. And once the content gets on Sketchfab, we want to make sure it meets an audience and so that it spreads on the internet and get outside of Sketchfab and gets embedded on the web. And two-thirds of our traffic is actually coming from our embeds, so outside of Sketchfab. And that's because, uh, same way, like we got integrated with all the publishing platforms. The best example is Facebook. We're natively supporting the newsfeed. So there are less than 10 media players supporting the newsfeed, so like YouTube, SoundCloud, maybe SlideShare, Sketchfab. Uh, which means that if you share a, a Sketchfab link uh, in a Facebook post, face, uh, Facebook will recognize our domain and, and display our 3D player inside the post and inside the newsfeed so that you can run the content in the newsfeed without opening a new page. And we've done that with Reddit and WordPress and LinkedIn and Kickstarter, and that made us the, the default way to embed uh, 3D content as well. So now just uh, a few trends in terms of content. One of our uh, top verticals is cultural heritage, and uh, it's a really fascinating trend. A lot of museums have started digitizing their collections in 3D for archival purposes. But there are also like a lot of normal people just documenting cultural heritage and capturing it in 3D 
Uh, most fascinating example is, uh, so on the left is the Lion of Mosul. So this is a 3D file that was made after the Mosul Museum was destroyed by ISIS in like last, last year. And so there was an initiative to cross-source the reconstruction in 3D of this museum by sourcing uh, 2D photos that were taken before the destruction and stitching them together to make a, a digital uh, 3D archive. And so that was one of the results. And then on the right, uh, it's a temple of Baal in Syria, uh, captured by a drone just, just after its destruction. And we have more people who are now yeah, making sure we are preserving forever like uh, pieces of art or amazing places and we're sure we have a, a volumetric archive of them. Another uh, very interesting trend is around news, uh, world events. On the left uh, is a 3D capture of Kathmandu right after the earthquake that happened uh, last summer. So this was again taken by a drone. Uh, we just flew over Kathmandu and shot a video, and then this video was turned into uh, steel frames, so maybe like 2,000 pictures. Those pictures were stitched together to make a 3D file and published the same day on Sketchfab, which means that literally 12, hour, 12 hours after the event happened, you were able to teleport yourself to Kathmandu and, and experience what happened there, uh, almost if you were there. And then on the right, uh, more anecdotal, uh, but this is a, a memorial for Prince. So the day uh, Prince died, many people put together like small memorials here and there, and, and this was in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, just someone took a, a free capture of, of this uh, gathering of a guitar and flowers and so on, and just another illustration of how we can um, yeah, capture an event in, in three dimensions, just, just like it is in the real world. Then brands and how we market products. If you think about it, uh, it's pretty insane to think that uh, on an e-commerce website, you're gonna see like 10 pictures of 10 different angles of a product to show what it looks like. Uh, some websites are getting into like 360 turnarounds um, about products, but it's still not like what the product really looks like. And now with 3D and VR, you're able to actually experience a virtual version of that product. Uh, which is pretty fascinating. So here are two examples. Adidas and Nestle uh, started using our player in their Facebook feed to show um, yeah, virtual versions of, of uh, a shoe and a, and a cookie. So very uh, consumer use cases. And then pretty much anything. Uh, people, so Matt in the middle. Uh, we see more and more 3D selfies popping up uh, in the feed. And then, yeah, people starting to scan their food. Uh, their apartments, their stuff, and just like all those trends we started seeing on Instagram of people shooting things that are personal to them. Uh, we're seeing the same trends in 3D. Um, yeah, just people capturing everything. Uh, and yeah, we believe it's gonna become a, a normal trend, uh, and we are here to, to push that trend. That's it, thanks. Very cool, thank you. Uh, didn't see the headshot of myself coming in the presentation. Okay, well, <laughs> got it. Um, any thoughts on the, or maybe uh, some information for the people here about what, what the latest is in terms of, um, you know, f our phones being able to capture 3D, because uh, it's been a trend that has been because, uh, you know, a few years in the making now is Retail Intel, and, you know, um, with Intel Real Sense and uh, Google Project Tango, and that's becoming a reality. Any, where, do you see that in the, happening in a, in a year or in three years? Or? So, so you can already make 3D with a phone without a dual camera, and so like my son Williams, it was done by taking a lot of pictures and then sti stitching them together using another software, so not captured in real time. And, and yeah, the idea with Tango or Real Sense is that you can capture 3D in real time. Uh, typically, like what a Kinect would be able to do by uh, sensing the depth, basically. Um, and the first products are really hitting the market right now. Like the first Google Tango phone shipped this summer. Uh, the P9 phone by Huawei shipped this summer. Uh, iPhone 7 has the hardware capability to do that but I don't think it will have the software yet, so I think they'll take their time until the software is good enough. 
Intel Redsense shipped uh, last summer, and so it's really becoming a reality. I think it's still the early days, still consumes a lot of battery, makes your phone very hot. Um, so maybe, yeah, I would say 12 months would be a, a good a good time frame for like having like consumer ready version of a phone that can make uh, free captures in real time. And in the meantime, if, if you want to take 3D uh, images, then the, the, the best option, other than some iPhone uh, options, is, is what a structure sensor? What, what, uh, so, yeah, structures. So, Matt was captured with a structure sensor, which is a, a little piece of hardware, or similar to a Kinect that you plug onto your iPad or, iPad or your phone, costs 300 bucks. And yeah, it adds basically the, the, the 3D capture. Um, feature, it works really well, and we use it every day. Okay, very cool. Do we have um, questions? Do you think over time when people start capturing um, objects in places at such a high fidelity that there'll be a market to purchase certain assets to be used commercially? Or, you know, what's the marketplace going to look like for a professional services company who's developing 3D experiences? So there are already many marketplaces that, that uh, were born before the VR and AR world uh, to buy and sell 3D assets, uh, used a lot by just like designers uh, or architects. Like if, if you are designing a, a hotel, you don't want to redesign all the chairs and you're going to buy a, a stock. Just like yeah, the Getty image for 3D files. Um, I think the goal for us is to, to go beyond that and, and be more of a social network for this kind of content. And our goal is more to monetize like the audience or the access to that content. Um, so creators would be able to monetize uh, Yes, the experience, typically like a museum, like the British Museum would uh, publish collections that are mostly free to, to browse and ad supported, and then some of them will be higher read and you'd need to be a, a paid subscriber to experience it in, in VR and 3D, for example. And maybe one last question from, from me. So you alluded to this a little bit, but um, can you talk about web VR and what that means uh, for, the, for the future of VR? Sure. Um, so yeah, web VR just it's just the, the VR, the web implementation of VR that lets you that lets the browser uh, leverage the, the VR specs of a headset, uh, basically like uh, positional tracking and things like that. Um, so, so instead of going to the Oculus App Store or the Vive App Store and downloading stuff, yeah. you go and you have a browser. If you click on the browser, then you have a, a web-like experience, except it's, it's VR. Is that, is that? Yeah, so it's, okay. it's, it's WebGL uh, <laughs> moved to VR. So yeah, today to experience VR, most of the, most of the content you, you need to go to the App Store, like the Oculus Store or the Steam platform, you're gonna download a game, uh, and yeah, run it locally on your, on your desktop. And WebVR lets you distribute the content um, just through the web. Um, and WebVR does a lot of the hard work uh, of like uh, being cross-platform. So WebVR scales naturally for all the headsets, uh, which means, yeah, for us it's the best way to distribute our content. It's, it's still very alpha. Um, so it's mostly supported by um, uh, Firefox and Google, only in the beta versions of the browsers, uh, so Firefox Nightly and, and Chromium. Uh, Microsoft just, just announced they're gonna push WebVR Microsoft Edge, it's expected to land into main Chrome in December. So this shows, it's, yeah, it's really becoming a reality uh, today, not, not two years from now. All right, I think we're out of time, but thank you so much. This was uh, terrific. Thank you.